Good morning. Welcome to Liberty Baptist Church. We're glad that you're here for our 11 o'clock hour of worship. If you're visiting with us, we're especially glad that you're here today. There's a card in the pew in front of you that says, Welcome. We'd love for you to take just a few moments to fill that card out. Uh, that way we can, we can have a record of your visit, and uh, you can put that in our offering plate or give it to uh, one of our ushers as you leave today. The South 40 is pretty rambunctious today. You guys are good. Over there, hello. Okay, um, <clears throat> anyways, there are a few things that we want to, uh, I want to remind you of that are in your proclaimer today. Uh, the first of which is uh, tonight is uh, the Christmas gathering. It is the beginning of uh, our Christmas activities here at Liberty Baptist. Uh, there are these cards that are in all the vestibules, and it, it, I think some of them are actually in the uh, proclaimers as well, and it gives you uh, all the activities that are going on. And so the first one tonight, the Christmas gathering, 6 p.m., and uh, we'd love for you to come back. You can learn more about uh, all of the different parts of Advent and uh, why we hang the greens in certain ways. And so it's just a wonderful time to come and learn more about the Christmas season and why indeed we celebrate. A few, uh, something else to remember is uh, we have a uh, Lottie Moon Christmas offering that is going on now. And we would definitely want you to consider what God would have you to give towards the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. There are little banks. I forgot to bring one up here. There it is. Here. She's so helpful. Okay, so um, there are these banks that are around the church, and you can put these, uh, you can just fill them up with change. You would be surprised at how much change you can fit inside of one of these and what a difference it can really make. So if you have children or adults, can uh, fill this up and uh, bring it back, and all of the money goes to our Lottie Moon Christmas offering, and it goes directly to missionaries uh, like we were about to see in the video uh, for Lottie Moon. So I would direct your attention to the screens at this time. The focus of our ministry here in Southern Mexico, particularly in the state of Oaxaca, is to plant churches among the indigenous people groups here. Yes. And it's very exciting for us to be able to be a part of, of going into these uh, places, these people groups where nobody is sharing the gospel with these people. To be sent is an honor, but it also means that people love you and those people support you. They want you to be successful in what God has asked you to do, and they will do anything it takes to help make that happen. The Lottie Moon Christmas offering enables the message of the gospel to bring life to the unreached peoples of the world. It has become very obvious to me that I was created to make God known and to make him known where uh, he's not. And if God's people will be obedient to what God is asking us to do, in our part of the world here, we can see, possibly in our lifetime, where we won't have any more unreached people groups. Colossians chapter 1 says, The mystery hidden for ages and generations is now revealed to his saints. God wanted to make known to those among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the first Sunday of Advent, so today we light the candle of hope or prophecy. This candle reminds us that God made a promise to his people. He gave them hope by promising to send the Messiah. Let hope enter our hearts as we wait for the Messiah, Jesus Christ, to come again.
Our hope this Christmas is in the, is in the coming of our long-expected Jesus. He is our almighty King. Let's stand together as we sing of the coming of our King. Christmas season, God, asking you to prepare our heart. God, we come to you to read familiar stories, to sing familiar songs, but God, we pray that this season does not become familiar to us in a bad way. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would give us fresh insight, not only to what you have done, but fresh insight into what you are doing May you use this service today to help us 
see your activity in your world with clear eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Love came down. His name was Jesus. He was our hope, our Messiah, our coming King. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Let's stand as we sing of our coming King.
Glad to be in your house today so we can study your word and learn more about you. Lord, we just thank you for being such a great God that during this Christmas season that you sent your son Jesus so to the earth so he could come and save us from our sins. Dear Lord, we just pray to be with everything that goes on in this service this morning. Be with Russ as he leads it. And pray that we have attentive hearts. And Lord, thank thee as we uh, take these tithes and offerings that it may be used for your glory. But this is I ask in your name. Amen.
Good job, good job. We like the encouragement. Now, it's been a while since you've clapped that much for one of my sermons. <laughs> oh, no, y'all didn't ask for that. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, let's take that enthusiasm and focus it to godliness, and we'll be right on track. Good job, Mason. Uh, we're glad you made the old bones live here. It's what we need sometimes. Well, you know, the time of preparation is upon us. I don't know if you know this or not. The countdown to Christmas is here. Thanksgiving is over, and in 27 days, to be exact, Christmas Day will be here. Before that time, this is what 
is on the calendar. The Christmas gathering tonight at 6 p.m. The next Sunday night, the children's Christmas pageant followed by the church-wide Christmas party. The next weekend on Saturday and then on Sunday night, the Word became flesh cantata. The next Saturday night, Handel's Messiah. The next Sunday afternoon, caroling. The day before Christmas, the Christmas Eve service will happen, not to mention the many Christmas parties that will be held by Sunday schools, not to mention the decorating most of you have not completed, not to mention the presents that most of you have not bought, not to mention the cards most of you have not written, not to mention the wrapping that still needs to be done, not to mention you got to keep your full-time job throughout this whole time period and not get fired, not to mention the many acts of charity that you need to show at this time of mention, not to mention the six that you'll have to avoid have I mentioned enough, you see. It's called the time of preparation. You know, the most interesting thing here is in all of this time of anticipation and preparation at Christmas with this long list of standard to-dos, I want you to use this moment in a busy season, this hour in a busy season, to make this your rallying point, to get prepared for Christmas in the most important way. You know, the most interesting thing is when our calendar gets really full, the last thing we expect sometimes is for God to show up in the midst of our busyness and want us to do something new. And today, as we prepare our hearts for Christmas, we have an old man and an old woman, a forgotten story in many ways, or at least an undertold story at Christmas. Not the standard characters, not the standard drama, but a call from heaven to be prepared in the most important way for what God will do this Christmas season. And so let's do this, church. We have a lot of things on the calendar, and it's a fun time. I'm glad we have a lot of things on the calendar. All of these things can be used of God to draw us closer to the heart of God. But let's focus our attention here these next four Sundays as our rally point to say, God, would you prepare my heart in the most correct way, the most important way this Christmas season. The primary preparation we should have is preparation to be ready for God to act. And to not only be ready for Him to act, but know what He's doing because we're attuned with Him when He acts. You have your Bibles, let's go. This series is the Christmas story according to Luke. So we'll camp out in Luke and we'll tell the Christmas story through Luke, the Gospel of Luke's perspective. Luke chapter 1 beginning today in verse 5. Believe it or not, there is a miraculous birth before there is a virginal conception or a virgin birth in the Christmas story. And many people have forgotten about this most important birth before the birth of Jesus. God sends one ahead and Luke tells us about him. The first point today we want to press upon you is the Christmas forerunner, God sends somebody ahead of Jesus, is preceded by the announcement of a miraculous birth. You know, we just need to tell the story of Christmas, so I'm going to read 20 verses, which means you're going to have to pay attention a bit. Um, but let's listen to this forgotten story, or this undertold story of Christmas. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. You there? Let's read it. In the days of King Herod of Judah, there was a priest of Abadiah's division named Zechariah. His wife was from the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. Both were righteous in God's sight, living without blame according to all the commands and requirements of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth could not conceive, and both of them were well along in years." When his division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, it happened that he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. 
And at the hour of incense, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and overcome with fear. But the angel of the Lord said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. And there will be joy and delight for you, and many will rejoice at his birth. And he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will never drink wine or beer. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb." He will turn many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. How can I know this, Zechariah asked the angel, for I am an old man and my wife is well along in years." The angel answered him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and I was sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. Now listen, you will become silent and unable to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words which were fulfilled in their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah amazed that he stayed so long in the sanctuary and when he did not come out he could not speak to them then they realized he had seen a vision in the sanctuary and he kept making signs to them and remained speechless when the days of his ministry were completed he went back home after these days a wife elizabeth conceived and she kept herself in seclusion for five months she said the lord has done this for me and he has looked with favor in these days to take away the disgrace among the people. Now you cannot say you don't know what this story is about because I just read it to you, okay? This is one of the forgotten stories of Christmas, and now you get the gist of the story. Let me make a few points. First of all, Luke begins the Christmas story by putting different characters in their place. The first person that Luke mentions in the story is a person that he quickly dismisses. But we, sh- if, if we would know a bit about the location, we would not as quickly have dismissed the first person that Luke mentioned in the story. Now, most of you don't know the first person that Luke mentioned in the story, do you? His name is King Herod of Judea. Now, I can say in my most in, in my summer trip to Israel, I had read a lot about King Herod, and I knew some things about King Herod, but when you go to modern-day Jerusalem and modern-day Israel, King Herod of Judea is still large man on campus. You can't imagine this, can you? The architectural feat of King Herod the Great was overwhelming. The, the walls around Jerusalem upon which the Dome of the Rock still stands today, the, the wall built by King Herod, you go any direction, north, south, east, or west, and you will marvel at the architectural genius of the Herodium, of Masada. You go anywhere, Herod is large man on campus. He is the puppet king, though appointed by Rome, to keep his thumb down on these Jewish people. King Herod was a genius maniac. It was said to, it would be better to be Herod's pig than his son because he'd likely, if you turned against him, he'd kill you. Herod is one big guy. How many people will be talking about what you built 2,000 years after you're gone? Not too many of you. And Luke dismisses him out of hand. He focuses on the temple and he focuses on an old priest who is functioning in the temple and his wife, the man, Zechariah. Now notice, God's activity is already spinning early in the gospel account, for it says that this was not Zechariah's assigned day to go into the temple to burn incense, but rather they just randomly chose who was to go, and in the providence of God, Zechariah was chosen. Zechariah enters into the temple merely to burn incense. May I make one simple point? 
Zechariah, the old priest who's been around Jerusalem and been around the temple and now is actually performing a priestly function going into the temple, the last thing that he is expecting to happen is God to actually show up. May I say that religious people, and I am unfortunately or fortunately uh, because I'm a minister exactly in that camp, we have a blind spot. Here it is. We can do religious services and leave God out. It's always been a problem. By the way, the one that God will raise up, he cannot put him at the temple. He's going to have to put him in the wilderness because the temple's not ready for what God's going to do. May I just make a few points? Zechariah is performing his priestly duty, and the last thing he expects is God to show up. And lo and behold, the angel Gabriel comes to Zechariah and does something else Zechariah doesn't expect God to do. Zechariah is not expecting God to answer his prayer. Because the angel Gabriel, if you've read it in the text, the angel Gabriel comes and says, your prayer has been answered. And I'm sure Zechariah is thinking, well, what prayer? The prayer that Zechariah had prayed a long time ago and now had gotten over, to be honest with you. The prayer that Zechariah and his wife had prayed for them to have a child to conceive. Sarah, I mean, not Sarah, uh, Elizabeth could not conceive, nor could Sarah conceive. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, and, and Elizabeth couldn't conceive, and so no doubt at some point in their life they had prayed for that. They had moved beyond it, and Gabriel says, now I am going to act. Here's the most interesting thing. God acts, God answers prayer, and when Zechariah hears all of this, his response is, guess what? Not one of faith, but of disbelief. Listen, Zechariah is the classic example of a religious person doing religious activities, not expecting God to show up, not expecting God to do anything, and when God actually does show up and to do things, the, the, the action of Zechariah is disbelief. You know what, sometimes, by the way, God doesn't appreciate Zechariah's disbelief. Because as soon as Zechariah starts, starts giving his reasons for disbelief, you know what God does? He goes, Shh, I didn't even want to hear it, Zechariah. And shuts Zechariah's mouth. Nine months and six days to be exact. Nine months and six days, God tells the old prophet, you, or the old priest, you need to sit around and ponder what God is doing. And can you imagine it? The people are at church as usual, doing things as usual, and here comes the old priest out. He can't speak. He's visibly shaken, and the people think God might be up to something. May I say that Zechariah's disbelief is so interesting because what does God promise Zechariah? You tell me. He promises him what? A child, a miraculous birth. God tells Zechariah, I am going to, to take a, a woman who cannot conceive and I am going to enable her to conceive. And Zechariah in essence says, God, I don't believe you can do it. Now think about who Zechariah is and where he is. Zechariah is a priest in Jerusalem, in the temple, the nation born from who? Father Abraham. And Abraham is an old man married to an old woman who could not bear a child. And God said, I'm going to give you a child in your old age. Zechariah, who stands in the line of the nation that God brought a child from barrenness, Zechariah cannot believe God will actually do it again. You know what I think the most interesting thing about Christmas is that sometimes we think, well, God did these nice little things back, back here, and he, he's done a lot, a lot of nice things, and they're nice, and when God moves in on you and says, now I want to do some of these right now in your time, you go, oh, no, no, God. 
I'll read the story somebody else, uh, somebody else acted in, but don't start meddling in my own life. Don't start doing things new in my life. And God tells Zechariah, because you don't believe, maybe you just need to sit there and listen for a moment. I wonder today if God actually told you he was going to do something, if your response would be good enough that God wouldn't have to just say, you need to be quiet for a bit and go sit over there and think about what I'm doing. You understand? Nine months, six days, the priest has to contemplate the activity of God. You know what Zachariah is supposed to do when he comes out of the, 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 um, the temple? Something that's been lost in, in some church traditions. How many of you say, receive the benediction? Remember this? You know, the minister holds up his hands like this and then pronounces a benediction, a blessing on the people. You understand this? Okay. So Zechariah was supposed to come out from the temple and pronounce the benediction. And he comes out and he can't speak. You know what God said? I don't want you to pray one prayer to the people until you can align that prayer with what I'm doing. By the way, after nine months and six days, Zachariah's going to get the prayer right. We'll see it here in just a moment. Well, let's just keep going. Not only do we have this miraculous, this call of a miraculous birth, the second point, the Christmas forerunner is named John by God himself. Now notice verse 57. Now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she had a son. Then her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown his great mercy, and they rejoiced with her, and then they came to circumcise the child on the eighth day, and they were going to name him Zachariah after his father. But his mother responded, No, he will be called John. And then they said to her, None of your relative ha has that name. So they motioned to his father to find out what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they were amazed, and immediately... At Zechariah, his mouth was open and his tongue was set free and he began speaking, praising God and fear came on all those who lived around them and all these things were being talked about throughout the hill country of Judea. All who heard about him took it to heart saying, what then will this child become? For indeed the Lord's hand is with him. Now notice we have not only this miraculous call for this miraculous birth. Now we have this divine naming. May I say what God is doing? Sometimes in life, God makes himself so obvious that people cannot deny that he's at work. I've been talking to a few people. I recently talked to someone who, who basically said, I've been resisting God and I don't know where God is, but God's done something so real in my life, I can't deny he's at work. You know, sometimes God makes himself so obvious, he kind of taps on us and says, I will be paid attention to at this moment in this situation, and this is one of those moments where God draws in close. He draws in close to this couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Now notice where we are in the story. Elizabeth has the child, and now in Jewish customs, on the eighth day, the child is circumcised. Now that sounds odd to us, but two things are happening here, and God is sending a powerful message. One, circumcision is the sign that demarcates someone as a Jewish person. It is one of the signs that this person is in the, the nation of Israel. They are part of the Jewish people. They have been branded as this group. So you have circumcision happening. And then in ancient times, you know, now we tell the kids, be whatever you want to be. Who cares if you like dad, like mom? You go out and live your own life and, and carry on whatever you, however you feel. Well, that's not the way it used to be. Used to be, you're going to be just like your dad, still more true than you want it to be, even if you do your own thing, act like you want to be, you know. That still has a way of creeping up on you. Uh, but um, so, so the idea here is this child is going to be named Zachariah who? Junior, right? That's what's in the text. We're going to call him Zachariah Junior. And God has shut Zachariah's mouth and now told Elizabeth, no, his, his name is going to be John. We'll later know him as John 
the baptizer or the Baptist, not our Baptist, the one who dunks you, another Baptist, but nevertheless, John's not the first Baptist. Bad to, bad to tell you that, so don't make that mistake either. So why is John named John? I have no idea. The only reason that we know that he is given the name John is the text tells us that nobody in Zachariah's family or in Elizabeth's family or nobody in the tree is named John. It just says nobody's had this name. It's not like, well, if it was dad's name, but maybe we had uh, an uncle. No, no. Nobody's been named John. What is God doing? God is saying that I have made, a, I am creating a child by a miraculous birth with a name nobody in this family has had. Why? Because God wants to do something new. Now, what is John's job? John is called God's forerunner, one who runs ahead. You need to anticipate Jesus at Christmas because if you don't anticipate him, you're likely to miss him. You know what, part of the joy of Christmas, especially in children, is anticipation. Did you know anticipation actually enables you to enjoy the moments, the events, in a greater way than have you not anticipated it? I mean, just think about how most of you adults are going to celebrate Christmas. It's the way it is. You'll try to wake up about 8 o'clock on Christmas morning. You'll stumble down. you say, look at all this money we've spent. You'll pick up a present, open it up, another pair of socks, another this. All right, can we go eat breakfast? And there it is. That's the way a lot of you adults celebrate Christmas. Don't lie. Okay? Not very festive. Now, let's think about the way a child celebrates Christmas. It's 27 days for us. 27 days will feel like that. For a child, it will feel like 27 years. You understand? I mean, he can't get here long enough, quick enough. Just that, I mean, they're conceptualizing the present, the present, the present, the present. I mean, what they want, what they want. And so what's going to happen Christmas morning, 5 a.m., 6 a.m., they're going to be pulling the, pulling the sheets of mom and dad. Say, come on, come on, come on, come on. They'll run downstairs, hands over their head, rip it open. And there they'll be. Why the difference? Because one has anticipated and one has not. One is ready to receive the gift and the other is not. May I say God needs to send someone ahead of Jesus for this simple reason. Mankind is not prepared for the gift. We are not prepared for the gift of Christmas unless we see that we need the gift. John has a one-word message. You ready for it? A one-word message. Repent. That's his message. Because God's rulership, his kingdom, is about to show up. Repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. God's about to show up and show off and you folks aren't ready for it to happen because you don't even see the need for God to show up and show off. You see this? Now notice, John, not only are the people not ready, the temple's not ready. You know where John has to go? This is interesting. If you go... Jerusalem is, let's just pretend Jerusalem is here, okay? If I were to travel from Jerusalem, from Jerusalem, from Jerusalem, I'm going down, 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 and here's the Dead Sea. Now what happened is a group of, a group of people, a group of religious people, picked up their Bibles, basically, left Jerusalem and hung out by the Dead Sea, miles away from Jerusalem, because they felt as though it was corrupt and nobody was ready to hear from God. You hear what I'm saying? And guess where God will send John the Baptist? Not to the temple. He'll send him to this little group hanging out in the wilderness, writing... How many of you have ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Anybody heard of that? Like... All right, that's where we are. We're at the Dead Sea. 
that little band that's probably writing up these scrolls, John the Baptist is right in that group. He's this group outside the temple saying, what's going on in Jerusalem isn't really worth having, and what we need is for the people of God to come back out into the wilderness to kind of have a revival service outside of the temple to get ready for what God is doing. And John the Baptist will have one simple message, people get ready, you have a need. May I say this one other thing? John the Baptist's message is simply this. We need God's intervention. We are a people who have a problem that we need God to solve. You know what? John the Baptist's message is pretty simple. Repent. God's about to do something big. You know what John the Baptist's other message was? Behold, when Jesus shows up, behold the Lamb of God who does what? Take away the sins of the world. That's his ministry. His ministry is one of preparation. His ministry is one of saying, God, how I need your intervention. How I need you to do something for me I cannot do. And folks, the moment we get over the fact that God has done for us that which we cannot do, we have become an unprepared people. Because may I say, you didn't just need God inter God's intervention sometimes back. You need God's intervention today. Did you know that? You need his grace for this moment. You need his grace for the next season. You need his grace. And I just wonder today if you don't need a forerunner to come to you and just say, do you still know you need God? Do you still know you need God to be with you? Do you still know you need forgiveness of sin? Do you still know that? Because if you do know that, the message of Christmas takes on a whole different meaning. Because what do you see? You see a God who is providing what you need. And if you don't see that, you don't have any idea what the Christmas story is all about. I just want to end this with Zachariah's prayer. The third and final point is the Christmas forerunner is given the task of announcing God's new activity in the world. Verse 67 says this, Zechariah, after nine months and eight days of pondering God's activity, finally can give it. Here it is, verse 67. Then his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Praise the Lord. By the way, Zechariah should have been able to pray this when? As soon as angel Gabriel came. If he was ready, he would have said, praise the Lord, the God, I mean, and he would have popped out of the temple, and he would have given the prayer. You understand this? And he would have said, look, God's doing something new. What we've been waiting on, he's finally done. Isn't this great? We're here. No, he doesn't do that. God's got to quiet him up for nine months for him to think about it. You understand? Now he's finally got the prayer right. By the way, I wonder how accurate your prayers are in line with God's activity in the present. I wonder if you're blessing God for what he's doing here, what he's doing in your life, what he's doing in your family's life. God, I see this and see this. Listen, I'll read the prayer. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited. I wonder how many months it took him to figure that one out. Oh, yeah, God showed up. Didn't expect that. And provided redemption for his people. He's bought us back. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, just as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets in ancient times. He told us about it, now he's actually doing it. Salvation from our enemies and from the clutches of those who hate us. He has dealt mercifully with our fathers and remembered his holy covenant. The oath that he swore to our father Abraham, at least he remembered that story. He has given us the privilege since, he, since we have been rescued from um, our enemies' clutches to serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness in his presence all our days. And child, you will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. He's got it. Because our God's merciful compassion, the dawn from on high will visit us to shine on those who live in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. 
The child grew up and became spiritually strong, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. I wonder today, if I could hear your prayer, how closely would your prayer mirror what God is doing? You know what the old priest figured out? I'm going to make this real plain. Because I think it has a pretty easy application to us in this place. God told the, the, the priest Zechariah, your task with your remaining years is to raise up a child. Listen carefully to what I'm saying. I'm going to say it again. God told Zechariah that with your remaining years, your task is to raise up a child who will raise up a generation to follow Jesus. Tracking with this? And may I say, I cannot imagine with the opportunities that God is giving Liberty Baptist that God is not telling some of you that your job is to raise up some people around you, to raise up a generation to follow Jesus. In church, you're going to have a huge opportunity to do that in just so many short weeks. And I wonder if God comes to you and says to you, look, I want you to, I'm about to do something new and fresh and big here in Appomattox. I want to raise, I want to recover a lost generation of 30s and 40s and 20s and teenagers who do not know me, and I want you to raise up some people who will raise up a generation to follow Jesus. And let me tell you, you can say, oh, no, 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 that ain't what we're going to do. Oh, goodness, I don't want to fool with that. I just want to do, I just want to come here and do it just like I've always done it. And God says, well, you can do that. But God might sit you in quiet over for nine, nine, ten months and say, you need to think about what I'm trying to tell you. And praise God that an old Zechariah could say, God, I see it. And I'm going to give myself to raise up this child because he will carry on your mission long after I'm gone. Folks, we are disciples to make disciples. Did you know that? We are disciples. The discipled should become the discipler. We should not rest until all the world knows. And if you haven't noticed, the world doesn't know. Unfortunately, most of our neighborhoods don't know. I'll give you you a Sunday off. Just stay around your neighborhood all Sunday morning and see who doesn't leave. You know what I'm saying? And God may be saying, why don't you raise up some people to raise up a generation to follow Jesus. I don't think it's any more plain. And you say, can God do that? Can God raise up a person to raise up a generation? Can God raise up people? Can God do a miraculous birth around here? I agree, amen with that. You know what, here's the deal. I just want to end with this one thing. You say, why why all these miraculous births around Christmas? You know, the miraculous births to me are important, but they need to be seen on a lot, lot bigger canvas. You know what? Here's the deal. The God who does miraculous births is the God who spoke creation out of nothing. You think a miraculous birth is something. How about speaking from nothing and bringing something to be. This is the God of the Bible. The same God who spoke something out of nothing is the same God who who promised Abraham and Sarah a child from barrenness to life. The same God who looks at a Zachariah and Elizabeth and says from barrenness to life who will look next week at a Mary and say, I don't even need need a husband. I'll do it by the Holy Spirit. Something out of nothing. You say, well, doesn't that stop at some point? No. The, the, The old 
Pharisee, Nicodemus, is going to say, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus of Nazareth is going to say, you must be born again. You say, what a word. The great new life God has to do is not just the physical life, although he can do that, but the life that he gives to our souls. And that's not it. You think, wow, miraculous birth. Isn't that going to be something? Wait until God makes all things new. Wait until he wipes every tear from our eyes. Wait until there's no more death and no more crying. Think a miraculous birth is something. What about the renewal of the whole earth? What about that? This is the God we serve. This is the message of Christmas. And folks, if we cannot believe God to do something that is not explainable by our own effort. If we cannot believe God to do something, then in my opinion, we probably need to sit down and just say, God, would you more tune my heart to your activity? Because the one person who wants to see people raised up to raise up a generation to follow Jesus, the one person who wants to see that more than anybody is guess who? God himself. And he is pushing, and he is working, and he is prodding, and he is jabbing, and he is silencing, and he is opening mouths. And if, and if we will just say, God, here I am. I'm available. He'll say, I see that, and now I'm going to do most of the work for you. Just stay along for the ride. You understand? Now you say, I didn't expect God to show up at this service. Yes, I know. I know. I'm being honest with you. God has not just acted. He still is acting. The Christmas story tells us that God will get more heavily involved than is comfortable for most of us. He'll come to the oddest places. He'll, he'll shake the toughest people. And if we'll just say, God, I need you, use me, he'll use you too. Don't let this be the same old Christmas. Don't get lost in all the stuff and miss God's activity. If you're here today and you say, Rusty, I'm dead. Well, the Bible has already told us that he can take from our death and give us his life. The message of Christmas is, do you realize you need God's intervention? The message of Christmas is he has done all that you need. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, I'll be right down here at the front, take the Bible and show you how you can be a Christian. And if you are a Christian, why don't we say, God, am I like that old priest who's coming to service and not expecting God to show up in service nor out of the service? May I be the person who expects to see him everywhere because the message of Christmas is God is now where? with us. Yeah, that's the message. For he shall be called Emmanuel, for he is God with us. And he's not just sitting next to you. He's going to elbow you a few times and spur you along to his activity. Why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, we pray we would be a prepared people. God, we know if there was a priest in Jerusalem in these days, and he was unprepared. God, these thousands of years later, God, we're probably unprepared too. And so, God, we just take these moments. God, we basically just say, God, we don't know what you're doing, but we certainly know what you've done, and we're open to whatever you want to do. And so, God, we know that the biggest thing you want is for us to raise up people, to raise up a generation, to follow Jesus. And so, God, we pray that you would perform that activity through us, that we would give ourselves to you, that either in silence to hear your voice or in worship to praise your name, we would give witness to your activity. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.
said of us that even though we were unprepared, we got prepared. And God, that we were able in our day to see what you are doing to such a degree that you used us to raise up a generation to follow Jesus. God, we thank you for the faithful example of Zechariah and Elizabeth. God, we thank you for the faithful role that they played in this Christmas drama. God, may we equally play a faithful role. If we are unprepared, may you so prepare us that we can see your activity and raise up a generation to follow Jesus. God, we pray you'd help us. And God, we know that you have not only going to help us, you're going to do it. You just want us to trust you in the process. So we pray you'd help us in Jesus' name. Rejoice.